let us get the show on the road this evening. Doc Yog Mahadio, alongside senior journalist of Kaitro News, Leonard Gildari, together to make the Room 592 and the men in black that I might say. <laughs> Carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin Smith and my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari. Welcome to the show. How are you, Leonard? Pretty good. Very long day, and uh, it's even going to get better. I do intend to take off my gloves on you tonight. And then the mute button <laughs> well, is working. Just, just be careful I don't mute your mic tonight, Leonard. Ladies and, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen all across the country, the Caribbean, our diaspora brothers and sisters, US, UK, Canada, wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. As we await the uh, connection with uh, Mr. Dr. Irfan Ali, let me inform each and every one of you that today, and I'm sure Mr. Gildari would agree with me, today we had a very interesting discussion on Elections Watch with the former Prime Minister of Barbados, Mr. Owen Arthur, and he was extremely outspoken on a number of things pertaining to these elections. And Leonard, that was clearly a very uh, outspoken gentleman today. He uh, no holds barred with some of his comments. And he certainly felt that CARICOM has a role to play and that CARICOM's role should not be disrespected by political players. What's your take, Leonard? Well, it's very, very clear, Yog, uh, that the CARICOM and our regional partners play a role in the development. We can never consider ourselves as an island that is by itself in the middle of the Atlantic, but rather we're surrounded by neighbors. We have CARICOM headquarters no, here. So we have to be very cognizant at all points in time that whenever decisions are taken, while we are a country, a sovereign country, it has to be taken into account very clearly that we have partners and whatever we do in Guyana would have repercussions. However, um, uh, what is made very clear uh, by uh, the gentleman today, Owen Arthur, and he is not any slouch. He was the, the team leader for the ob observers team that came to Guyana. They would have made some recommendations. We would have asked him several things as to what role he would have played, uh, whether he is friends by Jack Deere has been alleged, or whether he saw what he saw on elections in March the second, and he would have answered it. And we are going to replay uh, the interview over the weekend. Uh, and what is interesting also, he would have been able to map out very clearly the role of CARICOM in in countries like Guyana. And uh, what could happen if you... I don't put me on screen, right? But just make sure I... Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is also very clear is that uh, there could be repercussions, which is something we've been talking about, <laughs> sanctions, Yog. Uh, so these are things that have to be discussed as we move on, uh, whether uh, there's any adherence to, uh, uh, to, to the declarations that has been coming out or has come out last Sunday. So uh, in the meantime, I over to you, Yog. Yes, and thank you for that. And I just want to remind viewers and listeners as we await uh, to welcome Dr. Irfan Ali into our room 592, I just want to remind you all, ladies and gentlemen, that as of this evening, we do not know whether the uh, uh, low and field would have finished his report. Um, you know, so we await word from GCOM or from inside of GCOM, however you want to put it, as to the progress there. And the entire country is, of course, on looking on. Um, let me just say this to Leonard. Um, we do know that today, Mr. Owen Arthur would have also come to the defense of Ralph Gonzalez. We know that Mr. Gonzalez would have faced a lot of, uh, at least on social media and on, on I, this is my personal view, on the RAG. Um, as we know, there is the Guyana Chronicle, also known as the RAG, that is using taxpayers' money to spew political views of only one side of political divide of this country. And of course, that's my personal view, but it remains and I, re I will repeat it. So today, for example, the Guyana Chronicle had on its front page using taxpayers' money to denigrate a member of CARICOM. And I was very outspoken on that. But Leonard, let us uh, pause and let us say again to Mr. Kevin Smith, Joshua Van Sleitman, and to the Kaicho radio crew that works hard behind the scenes. Thank you, you guys are doing a great job. Let me also say thanks to Mr. Glenn Lal for making Room 592 possible. And as well, thank you, my co-host, for joining us tonight. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let us get room 592 going tonight as we wish to welcome Dr. Irfan Ali, who, as we know, the presidential candidate of the People's Progressive Party Civic, and as I, Yog Mahadeo, have said, and I take full responsibility for my statement, that I would like to welcome into room 592 president-elect Dr. Irfan Ali. Sir, welcome to this radio, TV, online broadcast. You're muted, sir. Unmute. Thank you very much, Dr. Yog Mahadio. I'm very happy to be joining you tonight. I Thank hope I you. can bring some clarifications to any questions or concerns you may have. It's my pleasure tonight. Thank you. And sir, may, Dr. Ali, just before we get going into the questions, please allow me. And ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. I wish to say this. Dr. Ali, before we start, we want to offer a prayer. This nation, sir, this nation prays with you tonight for the good health of you and your family, for the good health of President Granger and his family, for the good health of the chairman of GCOM and her family, Madam Claudette Singh and her family. The future of this nation, ladies and gentlemen, rests in the good hands of Dr. Irfan Ali and Mr. Granger. And of course, the immediate future rests in the capable hands of Madam Claudette Singh. And we certainly pray for your good health, sir, for the health of President Granger, and of course, for the health of Madam Claudette Singh. May God be with you and Mr. Granger. And Dr. Ali, we certainly ask that may God cast away all evil and bring you two men together so that this country can all find a future of humble and loving leaders. So Dr. Ali, with those prayers, welcome once again to our Room 592, sir. Thank you very much. Dr. Ali, I just want to you know, uh, how is your wonderful family tonight? I know you have a, a young son, uh, um, you know, just a couple months old, I would presume. Um, how is your family, sir? And how is your, uh, I, I would hate to say this to a man who's going to become the president again, but I'll still say it. How is your better half, sir? Well, first of all, let me thank you for asking <laughs> that question. Uh, it is unlike any other interview. I think sometimes <laughs> people uh, forget that we, we're not alone in uh, these struggles and alone in public life. So I thank you very much for your kind concern. Well, my family is doing well. Um, tonight, I would want to say that my family is the extended Guyanese family. So thank you for asking about my immediate family. That is my son and, of course, my wife. Uh, they're in good health, uh, which is important. But also, um, the Guyanese family is very important to me. And the struggles that the Guyanese family is going through, the uneasiness in our society, the um, challenges that so many Guyanese are facing uh, in our society in relation to their well being and their welfare is of much concern to us, the state of the economy. Uh, so when we speak about the Guyanese family, of which all of us are part of, um, I can say that. We are not sitting uh, nicely tonight in terms of the present circumstances that exist within communities uh, across our country. Thank you, sir. And as you mentioned that, uh, Dr. Ali, may I just ask you then, sir, what is your take on the next steps from a GCOM perspective? I know that you had the parties list, um, but of course, as you rightly said, this is holding us back. What, what is your perspective of the GCOM, uh, the GCOM matters going on? Uh -huh. Well, Dr. Yog, you know, it is very simple. Uh, we went through an elections uh, on March the 2nd, and that elections uh, uh, produced results, and the results uh, of, of that elections are known to us now uh, in the recount. It is, it is established once again uh, who won these elections, and in accordance with uh, Section 177, to uh, be of the Constitution, it makes it very, very clear. Um, it makes it very, very clear as to what uh, what is our present status, what is the present situation, and that is the PAP Civic uh, 
through its leader, uh, the presidential candidate, is deemed to be elected. The president is deemed uh, he is All deemed right. to be the president. Uh, however, uh, with the order that was uh, published, there are two events that need to take place before uh, we move uh, uh, at the uh, the outer date of the 16th to have a declaration, and that is a report by the CEO of GCOM, and then, of course, the declaration by the chair. So we are hoping that with all the voices globally, the regional voices, the international voices, the same voices, that good sense will prevail, that we can get past these elections, and we can move towards building our country, we can move towards uh, bringing meaningful change and me meaningful um, uh, measures that would take our fellow Guyanese out of the current situation they find themselves in. We also have to deal with the, pan the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenges that brings to us not only from a health perspective, but from an, an economic and social perspective. So my, my thoughts about GCOM now and about moving forward is that we should be able to have that declaration on the outer date of the 16th so that our country can move forward, so that our people can move forward, and so that the, the political environment can allow uh, some sort of ease, not only for Guyanese, but for investors and for everyone who are stakeholders in this. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Dr. Ali, Talking about, uh, you know, formation of government, and yes, sir, I must say that in recognition of 177, yours truly have been addressing you as president-elect whenever I talk on the radio. Um, sir, I want to ask you, before the elections, you and your party presented a manifesto to the people of Guyana. Now that COVID is there, now that there is such a deep hole in our treasury, are you going to reprioritize yourself and the stuff in your manifesto given the new emergencies we are facing in the country? Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Yo, we are committed to the, our manifesto. Mm -hmm. We went to the elections uh, with a manifesto. Uh, we saw the vote of Guyanese uh, with a manifesto. And we have a moral and ethical responsibility to ensure that the promises, the targets, and, and the programs we set out in that manifesto, that we achieve all of those. So it's very important that uh, we are able to, to move forward in implementing that manifesto. So there is, no, there is no stepping back from our manifesto. There is no stepping back from what, from the targets we have in that manifesto. For us, it is a contractual relationship between us and every single Guyanese because they place their confidence in us uh, by voting for us based on that manifesto. So I just mm -hmm. want to make that very clear. However, uh, Dr. Mahadeo, you are making a very important point. We have, to, we have to do a full assessment in relation to the economy presently, what is taking place, the challenges in the economy, and, um, and where we are in terms of finances. We know, for example, that a loan, a, a loan facility of $30 billion uh, was the, the government entered into the agreement with Republic Bank for $30 billion to support Kaisuku. We have not heard anything about any of that expenditure in relation to Kaisuku and the sugar industry. But yesterday we woke up to a headline that Guy Sukwe is out of cash and, and they have no finances to continue the operation. We are talking about 32,000 persons indirectly. And that is an addition to who would have already suffered when they closed those estates. You're talking about 32,000 persons more indirectly and another 15,000 directly who uh, can be placed in the breadline if we don't take immediate steps to stop the, uh, the decay and decline of the sugar industry. And that is one of our important targets in the manifesto. So, you know, it is very important for us to understand what is taking place, uh, where the finances are. 
we left a track record uh, in 2015 that, that can be reviewed, that can be analyzed. 10 years of continuous uh, growth before we left government in 2015. In the last four years, our average growth was about 5.4%, while the average growth of Latin America and the Caribbean was just about 3.1%. For a matter of fact, the Caribbean Development Bank, the IDB, the IMF, uh, Latin America, they all rated us as one of the up and coming shining economy. And that was without oil. That was without oil and gas. So that is where we were in, 20, in, in 2015 when uh, the, 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 the AP and UAFC came to government. And we did a lot um, during the period during government. You would recall the, uh, Dr. Mahadeo that our external debt to GDP ratio was more than 580% when the PP Civic took, uh, took office. We were able to bring that, bring that down to almost 45%, from almost 600% to 45% when you left office. These are the type of changes that took place. Our international reserves, when we left office, our international reserves were well in excess of 750 million US dollars. Our rice production, increased when we came into office from less than 100,000 tons to almost close to 600,000 tons. And the revenue also increased because we had better markets and everything. So that is the type of uh, difference that the People's Progressive Party Civic made. And now we are at a point where we are taking over again and we have to analyze the slate that we're taking over. <clears throat> we have to look at, <clears throat> if you want to put it this way, at the balance sheet. We have to look at the assets, the liabilities. We have, <clears throat> we have to look at all the accounts to see exactly what we are taking over uh, as we transition into a phase of implementing the measures, the policies, and the programs that we have in our manifesto. We know also that there are severe challenges in terms of the, the satellite accounts or if you want to, to put it, uh, the, the non-central government accounts, but like for example, the C Central Housing and Planning Authority, those are, the accounts had billions of dollars. We are hearing there is no money there. The gold reserves has been depleted from almost from 20, almost 25 billion to less than uh, less than 100 million now. That is what we are hearing. This is this is a challenge that we are coming in to meet. The, the international reserves moving, uh, uh, decreasing by almost 60%. So there is a lot of analysis, a lot of work that has to be done. We have to get a hold of all the reports. And very quickly, we have started with whatever information we have, but we are very much notwithstanding the challenges that we see ahead. We are very much committed to that manifesto committed to the targets in, in, in that manifesto in bringing real benefit and uplifting the lives of every guy in it. <clears throat> I thank you so that. much. Thank, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Um, sir, I, I need to ask you a question that is aside from, from the politics of the country. Um, if one would recall, when Al Gore ran for president in, after being vice president of uh, Bill Clinton. Everybody was concerned whether Al Gore could have been his own, his own person. My question to you, Dr. Ali, now that you're at a threshold, now you're at that point, a lot of people have this concern that uh, President Jagdeo, former President Jagdeo, being such a strong personality, whether you would be your own man, so to speak. Sir, Will you be your own man, or is there a risk to some of the persons in this country that Doc, uh, Dr. Jagdeo will overrun or will superimpose himself over I, you and, and your presidency? I don't know. I don't know, first of all, Dr. Mahadeo, I don't know that Dr. Jagdeo presents any risk to this country. The risk that we are having in this country right now is what we are facing. You are seeing who are presenting a risk to this country, a risk to democracy, a risk to the rule of law, a, 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 risk, a risk to the democratic will of the people. Let me put that very clear. And I have dealt with this. I have dealt. I have yeah. dealt with this 
I have dealt with this matter a number of times, and I don't know how, how much more clarity I can bring to it. I went through an entire campaign. Guyana has seen uh, the PPP campaign. They have seen Irfan Ali as a presidential candidate, and they have heard me answer this question on numerous occasions. I, and I will say to you that my answer would not change. My answer would not change. I have demonstrated to you, I've demonstrated to the Guyanese people, we have demonstrated to the Guyanese people as leaders of the People's Progressive Party Civic that we are committed to the task of improving the lives of people through the implementation of the plans and program in our manifesto and by bringing together the best human capital and human assets we have available here in Guyana and in the diaspora, firstly, to implement the manifesto and to bring real change and benefit to the Guyanese people. Where those skills does not exist within Guyana, within the diaspora, then we have to go outside of that. Mr. Jack Dio has tremendous skills. Dr. Jack Dio has tremendous skills that are relevant, important, and, and is an asset to our country at this moment. And Air Finale, as president, will be utilizing those skills to its greatest capacity for the benefit of Guyana, for the benefit of Guyanese, and to bring real development and growth to our country. I don't feel on the mind. I don't feel sidestep because I have answered this many times. I am Air Finale. I am, my, I am I'm a man in my own rights, and we are going to work as a team. And this team is not only the PPP Civic, yo. Let me make this very, very clear. This team I'm talking about is reaching out into civil society, reaching out to tap into the reservoir of skills, the reservoir of human potential, the reservoir of, of, of skill sets, skill sets that we have available here in Guyana right. to manage the new economy. Not only to manage the new economy, but to rebuild the existing economy to ensure that people return to work, to ensure that new jobs are created, to ensure the housing program is rejuvenated and work in the interests of the people, to ensure that people have access to a better standard of living, to ensure that you have an efficient uh, social service, efficient social service, to ensure that every guy needs to have access and not only access, but can complete not only primary and secondary education, and also right. to ensure the future revenues of our country will be used so as to not deny any segment of the Guyanese population the opportunity right. to be the best they can be. Correct. So, Dr. Ali, here is another side of it all. As you articulated quite rightly, um, the, the, the issue, one of the issues, of course, is the depleted reserves of the country. Um, you know, last night we had a, a program discussing economic and finance, and we found that, uh, according to one of our experts, Guyana's finances and economics is in a state of comatose. Now, you have that. And, of course, I'm sure you're going to attract the right people to help to rejuvenate the economy. But, sir, you're also inheriting a broken country where we have serious race problems, where we have serious issues with each other. The longer this election takes to be delivered, the more fractured we become as a society. How does President Ali uh, plan to, to deal with race relations, plan to deal with the healing of Guyana, sir? Thank you very much for that question, uh, Dr. Mahadio. All of these things are linked to the social, economic, and political fabric of our society. Race relations is very important. And you mentioned that we have a challenge now. But Dr. Madia, we must not be afraid to go into this challenge and to see what is the cause of this challenge. Because if we are to address these issues, we have to sometimes go to the root cause of the issue. And we have to ensure that we build a platform that addresses the issue from the root cause. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The issue of trust, mistrust, and all of these things has to be addressed. 
But when you have uh, people getting away scot-free on social media, some of whom have no interest in Guyana, but they sit in New York, they sit in North America, and they, and they spread hate, hateful speeches, they make hateful posts, they spread division, and we do nothing about those people. When you have leaders, and I'm very disappointed in some of the young leaders who are from the AP and UAFC, and I'm not afraid to call them out. We must not be afraid if you, Dr. Mahadio, see a statement from Air Finale that has the slightest element of a race stone inside, you will call me out. Yes. yes. And you'll ask me to speak and answer directly. Why else we, we must have the same standards for everyone? We have to ensure that we call people out and we deal with them. Because we cannot let them use hate and race to separate us. It has no place in our society. We also, and one of the important things from a political perspective is to build that trust, to build political trust. We cannot, and one of the hindrances to political trust is when the, when the fabric of our democracy is attacked, when the will of the people is attacked, when your democratic values in terms of an election is attacked. That is why we have to get past this period. And we have to bring all the leaders around the table. And we have to build an agenda and a platform that reflects the desire and the will of the majority of well, all guys. You will not satisfy everyone. But it has to be an agenda that cuts across the needs of all segments of the Guyanese population. We have to deal with the issue of inequality. We have to reduce, when you reduce poverty and work at a community level, you have a grassroots approach or a pro-poor approach to growth and development. It helps. Mm -hmm. People must not feel as if uh, they will be uh, separated from the growth and development that takes place. They must not believe that only one group will benefit. And that has to come from a common understanding as to where the country is going, the developmental right. platform, what structural changes are going to, to come, how is it going to affect the lives of people, what institutional changes are we going to make in the governance mechanism to deal with issues of race relations and so on. These are things that we have to work together on and have a common agenda in addressing if we are to build that trust right. And to, and to break down the walls of the vision that some see bent on creating. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I must say to you, sir, that um, you're truly under the, the leadership of uh, our host, Leonard Gildari, during the day. We have been calling out a lot of people who we believe have been spouting, I call it nonsense, um, on right, the, the people that. of this country. So, Dr. Ali, I, I, want to, I want to quickly acknowledge something you said, because it is key. It is a very important element that we as a people must remember. You have given me a word, and I applaud you for that, sir. I think we need to, and I mean this positively, exploit whatever knowledge, skills that Dr. Jagdeo has, exploit whatever knowledge and skills Mr. Granger has, exploit to the positive sense whatever other leaders have to help to develop this country. Dr. Ali, you did say uh, recently within the last week that your government will not uh, look into witch hunting. Uh, but sir, we have a concern. We, the people of this country, have a concern. While we understand your political statement, shouldn't those who have done the crime pay for the time? Should, should we reward people who have stolen and people who have done wrong by pardoning and, and say no witch hunting? Your comment, sir. Well, Dr. Mahadio, no witch hunting has nothing to do with illegality. Okay. No witch hunting is separate from dealing with illegality. I have made an appeal to all, uh, for, I'll give you one example. I have made an appeal to all uh, finance officers, all accounting officers, in, uh, in the government 
to ensure that at all times they act within the law, to ensure that they safeguard the assets of the state, to ensure they safeguard the records of the state. And I will say this to you, Dr. Mahadio, that we are not on a witch, uh, witch hunting exercise. And we are not on an exercise to, to denude the, 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 the government circles of anyone. But what I'm saying to you is that whilst we're not on a witch hunting, we have <clears throat> placed uh, all officials in the government service on notice that they will be held, <coughs> excuse me, they will be held accountable. They will be held accountable for uh, the records. They will be held accountable for the assets. They will be held accountable for their stewardship. <coughs> they will be held accountable uh, for, the, the, for the, the finances that they would have supervised. Illegality. If after 2018, we went into a period uh, where the no confidence motion came into effect, and we consistently warned, especially after the CCJ would have ruled that the government was acting within certain limitations. You, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mahadeo, and I would have seen many documents that would have shown that the government acted outside the limitation that we expected them to act after that uh, no confidence motion. We saw it all. We can, for ex another example is, we are hearing that contracts are being renewed now. That mm -hmm. billions of dollars are expended on a contract that is so sourced. With no resources available, there's no budgetary resources to cover it. So take, for example, if we, if we assume office next week and there are no resources in the Treasury to cover these expenditures, then you're tying the hands of the incoming government, that's one. Two, you'll enter into a financial transaction without having the budgetary resources to do so. Three, you'll have, been, you'll have broke, broken the procurement laws. So all I'm saying is that the professionals the technocrats, the accounting officers need to ensure that they do the right thing. Mm -hmm. But you and, cannot and, reward, and I agree with you, illegality is different from witch hunting. Great. And sir, um, on that point, um, if you can talk for a moment about transparency of your government. Uh, I do know, and I must put on record, uh, it is it is the last it was your government over the past 23 years that would have issued the first uh, um, audit reports of, of any kind that the country could have reviewed and seen because prior to that it was all hidden. But talk to us about transparency and how you are going to be more transparent than the, the, the incumbent. Well, first of all, Dr. Mahadio, this uh, the issue of transparency and accountability is one that we can examine uh, throughout the period of the TP civic in government. Not only did we brought back the Auditor General report and ensure it was stable in the parliament, we also had uh, many changes in our procurement laws. We established an independent procurement arm. We took away uh, the powers for duty free, for example, from the Minister of Finance, and we placed it into a statutory body. We, uh, we, we brought the, the Procurement Act. We brought the Fiscal Financial Management Accountability Act. These are all modern financial architecture that the PPP Civic brought to enhance the institutional framework that governs the issue of transparency and accountability. We brought the FIU in place, the Financial Intelligence Unit in place. We, we staffed the, or the General Office and made it independent. These are things that we brought under the People's Progressive Party civic government. The Public Accounts Committee is chaired by an opposition MP. But notwithstanding all of that, it has to, it is an evolving process. Because as you're well aware, <clears throat> your situation does not remain static. There are many changes. Uh, we have now an oil and gas sector that is coming. 
So we have to ensure that our financial architecture, our governance mechanism is enhanced, strengthened, and new areas that we have to look at are put in place so that we can, uh, we can enhance our transparency and accountability aspects of governance. That is why in the manifesto, when we spoke about oil and gas, we said that transparency is a paramount aspect in terms of the overall management of the resources. We also have to ensure that there is greater involvement. I think a lot of the problem sometimes comes from misinformation or lack of information. And that is as a result of uh, not having the, the, the type of reach. So with greater involvement, with greater involvement at the parliamentary level, with great involvement of civil society, <clears throat> with a more open approach to governance, I think a lot of the issues that sometimes are misconceived <clears throat> through misinformation or disinformation campaign can also be clarified. Look, for example, Dr. Mahadio, at the hydro project. There was so much of propaganda around the hydro project and misinformation that Guyana missed an opportunity. And who suffered when we missed that opportunity? It is the people who today could have been getting electricity at 80% less the cost than they are paying today. Look at the specialty hospital. Again, misinformation and a narrative that was created uh, by the then opposition that uh, you know created a negative impression in the public domain about the project. Mm -hmm. Today, we do not have that specialty hospital. Mm -hmm. Look at the Marriott Hotel, another transformational project. In the Marriott Hotel uh, project, there was a lot of misinformation again. But, but after five I... years, after five but, years in government. Yeah. Yeah, go but, ahead. But can I counter, can I counter by saying misinformation is, is probably a uh, part of not enough information as well. Um, so my, my next, my follow-up question to you would be, is your government, will your government be more transparent than the previous PPP government, sir? Well, I don't, I, your, your question is supposing that the previous PPP government was not transparent. What I'm saying, Dr. Mahadio, is that the PPP civic built or started the construction of a financial architecture to enhance transparency and accountability. The next PP civic government would continue to build from that platform to enhance transparency and accountability. But I'm going a step further by saying to you that in doing that, we have to ensure that the information set is widened so that more of the Guyanese society, the civil society, for example, they're included in the information flow in government so that we can correct some of the misinformation. Okay. That is the point I make. Thank you. I know that my co-host Leonard has been raring to go at you, sir. Leonard? I'm not sure what you mean by raring to go, but I want to <laughs> ask, uh, ask Mr. Irfan Ali, Doc, how are you doing? All right? Good, good, and how are you doing? Pretty good, sir. Are you nervous? About? About uh, <laughs> taking the, the helm of this country. You're going to be seated in the most powerful seat uh, uh, maybe in a few weeks' time. Well, I'm not, I'm not nervous. I'm just, uh, what I will, what, what I want, how I want to classify it is that I'm ready. Our team is ready. And we are ready to move forward with a broadened approach, a widened approach, a collective approach in building this country. And as a follow-up to York's question there, consecutive administration uh, has been dogged by perceptions of corruption. What do you say to the people, to Guyanese people who believe uh, that your government uh, might be a little willing to bend over backwards uh, when it comes to giving supporters, uh, persons who would have worked closely with the administration, a little leeway in contracts and uh, uh, public monies? Well, first of all, I want to start with the premise of your question. 
You use the word perception. Yes, sir. So we have to we have to be we have to separate the two. Perception from real. What is real? And in dealing with uh, real corruption, in dealing with the issue of transparency, it has to it has to start from a governance structure. And we don't have to bend backwards to give anyone any preferential treatment. Again, I go back to some of the things that we did. We took away the power uh, for the granting of duty free from the Minister of Finance and gave it to an independent agency in the GRA. That was what the People's Progressive Party Civic did. Today, we have seen that power residing back. The Minister of Finance playing a role. We have said in the manifesto that the, the political arm of government would have an arm's length relationship in terms of the management of the oil and gas sector. That as far as possible, we are going to utilize the competent technical people to manage the sector. And it's one of the sector that persons have a lot of concerns about. In terms of contract administration and contracts, we are the one who brought the uh, National Procurement and Tender Administration Board <clears throat> and es established that as an independent agency to award contracts. Prior to that, contracts were awarded at the ministerial level. What we saw after we left government, we saw that it went back to a situation where ministers increased their limits. Ministers increased their ministerial limits to more than $20 million for the award of contracts. And an important, and you raise this, we have seen documents where in some ministries you have, you have hundreds of contracts awarded at the ministerial level, avoiding the National Procurement and Tenant Administration Board with that single act of increasing the contract limit at the ministerial tender board. These are things that the PPP Civic did not do. Are you going to These reverse are it? Are you going to reverse it? From. Are you going to reverse that, sir? Of course, we, we have said, uh, uh, Mr. Gildari, in the manifesto, that we are going to review all of these things. We are, and we have to reset the governance button to ensure that where the excesses exist, where the waste exists, where the, the, the cutting of the corners using uh, the political arm exists, we are going to go back to a system and we're going to implement a system where there's independence, transparency, and accountability. Do you believe, mm -hmm. sir, in criminal sanctions for corrupt government officials, public officials? Not only do we believe in this, or do I believe in this, we have said in the manifesto, we give an example that if a minister or an official of the People's Progressive Party civic government fails to declare any resources that comes in the oil and gas sector, for example, that that person, whether it's a minister or a technician, would face criminal charges. On the issue okay. of Gaisuko, back to Gaisuko, 7,000 workers at least from seven estates to three estates. What are your plans uh, within the first six months to deal with the issue of Gaisuko? And what do you say to the workers, 7,000 workers, who would have lost their jobs? Well, first of all, uh, Leonard, uh, Dr. Mahadio raised a very important issue. We are all aware of the $30 billion facility that the government sought to help Gaisuko. To this date, we have not seen how these resources were spent, how much of this resource was spent, and how much was utilized in Gaisuku. But we woke up two days ago to a headline where Gaisuku is saying they're out of financial resources. So the first thing we have to do, and we have started with whatever information is available to us, but we have to do a comprehensive assessment in the shortest possible time so that we can, uh, we can arrive at the financial status of Gaisuku, 
We can understand what is available in the treasury. We can understand what took place with this $30 billion, how much of that is available. And then, of course, as we said, we are committed to keeping the industry, whilst at the same time, we work on a support system and mechanism for those uh, workers who are laid off. We are committed to those things. But as I said, the situation that presents itself to us is one of serious economic and financial decay over the last uh, couple of years. But President, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Ali, um, here is, here is the, one of the other challenges you have then. One, you don't have any money in the treasury. Two, the, the, the source of finances have all but dried up because of COVID-19. In other words, every industry across the world, not just Guyana, has been declining. But three, sir, the most important part of this, which is my question to you, given that COVID is here, given that people across this country are begging for some relief, given that people are, are start, one in every four child is, is, is in need of a meal, you yourself, I believe, I understand, has headed a, a, a relief team that went around and, and you undoubtedly would have seen people suffering. Sir, is it too much for the people to ask or expect from your government that you will immediately relook at electricity rates, at, at, at telephone, uh, whether there is a relief on, on, on utility bills, whether there is relief on interest rates at the bank to service overdraft and so forth? Because your background, of course, is finance. Well, Dr. Mahadio, you, you, have, you would have heard uh, me on previous occasion. Uh, I said and I outlined very clearly our COVID-19 strategy. The strategy has a financial aspect, an economic aspect, a social aspect, a health aspect, a transition aspect as to how we're going to transition to the reopening of the economy, and a support aspect at a household level, at a community level, at a business level, at the level of the economy, and, the, and this includes the financial sector, for example, the insurance sector, 25 to 30 percent of premium, the premium has, has declined by as much as 25 to 30 percent. The retail and construction sector, has the, uh, activity in that sector has declined by almost 60 percent. You have almost 25 percent of our people are not employed at this moment, are not earning at this moment. So, yes, you will see a holistic strategy that will bring relief to people, that will bring relief to businesses, that will bring relief to our economy, that will inject, that will inject resources in our economy to, to speed up the, uh, the, the healing as a result of COVID-19. And where these resources will come from? You, you asked that question earlier. Yes, the treasury is empty. We faced this when we came into government in 1991. But what we have to do <clears throat> are a few important things. We have to reprioritize our expenditure set. Over one hundred, We had over $100 billion of wasteful expenditure in the last five years. That $100 billion of wasteful expenditure could have done so much for our country. So we have to restructure the expenditure uh, profile in the budget to ensure that priorities are placed in the areas that are important, especially at this time when we have to deal with the implications of COVID-19. We also have a situation where Guyana did not receive a lot of uh, financing from IFIs because of the current political situation that exists, because of what is taking place in the political environment in our country. IFIs would not deal with us. So as soon as a legitimate government takes office, then we have to quickly approach these IFIs. We have to quickly approach these agencies to unlock those resources 
to unlock those resources for Guyana so that because you will need that budget support. You know, you, you know this, you that mm -hmm. with the current situation, with the current e economic and financial situation that exists, we will need this type of budget support to help us moving forward. Sorry, a little follow up on that Gaitsuko uh, question. What are your thoughts about the privatization process that would have been started by the uh, administration under the coalition? Are you going to reverse Well, that? I don't know. I, you, maybe you can advise. I don't know <laughs> what process was started, uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gildari, because we have no information. The only thing we know about this privatization process is that lands were given away. We don't know how much was paid. We don't know what system was followed. We don't know anything about the privatization. I don't know if you have more information than I have. But, but there was no structure. There was no structure to the approach. So mm -hmm. what we have to have for Gaisuku is not only the issue of privatization. You see, York will, will tell you, and you also would know this, that when you, you can sell an asset when it's a peak or an asset when it's dead. They have now killed the industry. So what are you going to sell now? And what would you receive for the asset uh, and, the sec uh, and, and the industry as it is now? So we have to work on a transition model, a model, first of all, that seeks to put back these workers to work, a model that would bring back the industry to a level that we can then proceed to look at private investment, a partnership approach, these are things we have to take forward as we examine mm -hmm. what is the best model under the current circumstances and situation that exists. And for this, we need access to the information. When they closed the Wales Estate, for example, we said at a minimum, you should have an economic and financial analysis as to the impact of the closure of that. They did not do this. So we have to have, and we have to move very quickly. And th this would require us uh, pulling as much skills as possible from across our society to, to have this process advance so that we can bring relief to this industry and get this industry back up and going. Sorry, I want to bring Dr. you... Ali, go, go ahead, go ahead. Lan. Sorry about that, Yo. Uh, I want to bring and you... And let me say this, just yes. before Yo comes in. Gil Mr. Gildari, you will be aware that we did this before. We did this before. Rice, sugar, bauxite, the international reserves, everything was done here when we came on in 1991. The country was bankrupt. And look at where we took the country and handed the country over in 2015. And where we are today. I would understand that a lot has to do with leadership, a lot has to do with having competent people, and a lot has to do with ensuring the right priorities are the target of the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, want, I want to bring you to the issue of oil now, um, uh, Dr. Ali. Oil contracts, and you would have uh, mentioned it a little earlier, but I want to go directly to uh, where we are mm -hmm. with regards to the best deal. What are some of the plans? Uh, is it, uh, have you changed your mind or have you made up your mind as to how we're going to deal with Exxon, uh, uh, with the cost, with what Guyana is getting, with our um, uh, social projects and everything else? Is there going to be a renegotiation of that contract? Well, um, Leonard, we have not changed anything. What is in the manifesto is exactly what we are committed to because we are elected based on that manifesto. And we have a moral responsibility to stick to that manifesto and to, to implement that manifesto. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we have made it very clear that there will be an approach to the sector. First of all, we have to ensure we have the right technical capability and capacity. We have to ensure that we have our best available human assets assigned to the task of managing. We have to have a skill gap analysis to see where the gap exists in terms of us managing the sector. 
And whilst we buy those skills uh, initially, we have to train Guyanese here and in the diaspora to fill that skill gap. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, again, there's been so much secrecy surrounding this sector. We have not seen agreements. We have not seen contracts. We have not seen uh, approvals. These are things we don't even know, for example, the quantum of gas that we're talking about. So how are we going to define what a gas industry would look like? So we have to get all of this information very quickly. We have to analyze it. We have to then work on a strategy in keeping with our commitment to the people, reviewing <clears throat> the contracts, ensuring that the contracts work in the interests of Guyana and Guyanese, arms length relationship of the of politicians and the management of the sector, the involvement of civil society, issues of transparency and accountability in keeping with the best international standards, ensuring that we have a, a sovereign wealth fund act that works in the best interest of Guyana now and in the future. That act mm -hmm. has to work in the interest of Guyana now and in the future. Built into that is the issue of transparency, accountability, and ensuring the resources is spent in the best interest of our people. Sir, if I can just add two tags there that I would want to ask your comment on. One is, of course, local content policy, because, uh, you know, that has to be one of the more vested interests of ensuring Guyanese get, a, a, you know, a, a lot of committed um, um, contracts and so forth. So con uh, the content, local content policy is one. But, but two, how, how concerned will your government be for environmental protection and, and all of these dangers. Because as you know, God forbid if something go, happens with, with the oil, uh, Guyana will be having to bear the brunt of, of those costs. Yeah, that, those are important issues. And Dr. Mahadeo, you would know that in our manifesto, we speak to the issue of local content. The government has a responsibility to ensure that our businesses, the private sector, and our people, that they are equipped to make use and take up the opportunities that exist within the sector also. To do this, government itself has to give some incentives to the private sector. We have to invest in the human capital because we are starting from a position that Trinidad, for example, it's, not, it's way ahead of us. So we are starting from behind. So we have to rapidly help our local private sector and our human potential to come up to speed with what the industry required, with the standards that the industry required, so that there will be no excuse in terms of local content. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, logistical support. We have to ensure that this, this, the industry itself is built on a platform that the local private sector can be given through incentives and through government support, the ability to compete and equip themselves to make use of the opportunities that lies there. That is very important. Okay. Uh, outside of this, we are gapping because we can't talk about local content if we are not willing to support the local private sector, to support the human resources of our country, to meet the requirement of what the industry needs. And that is, of important, that is an important aspect of management of the industry and having the local content. Environmental okay. issues are very important. But mm -hmm. first of all, we have to ensure we have the institutional capacity. We have to ensure that in the short term, we buy that capacity where it does not exist. But for the mm -hmm. sustainable management of the sector, we have to invest in building our own capacity. We have to ensure that our environmental regulations, guidelines, laws, they're all upgraded. Mm -hmm. They're upgraded to take care of this new sector. Right. And not only upgraded, 
but then so they're integrated to the rest of our country. We right. cannot have a piecemeal approach to the sector. The sector has environmental aspect. It has the aspect of human capital, the management and administration of the sector, issues of transparency and accountability. So we have to look at the totality of the sector. And indeed, in dealing with the environmental issue, we have to build institution, we have to build a governance structure, we have to build the right laws and regulations, the legislative framework, and then of course, we have to provide the political will and support the technical capabilities in, in managing and ensuring that the sector is governed in a way that is sustain, environmentally sustainable. All right. And just a follow up there, Dr. Ali, with regards to the environment, for example, or let's say standards, you know, um, would your government be uh, pushing your own watchdogs? In other words, are you going to be, uh, uh, you know, embracing the, the, the concept of transparency so that you are empowering watchdog groups that can advise and even criticize you on things like the environment and standards, etc.? It will, will that be possibly one of your approaches? We, we have made it very clear in the manifesto that we are going to manage the sector in keeping with best practices, guidelines, and international standards. And whatever framework is within the best standards and guidelines, those are the things that we have to support. We went beyond, we went beyond the issue of watchdog groups. And we said that we have to involve civil society into this. The management of the oil and gas resource is not only at a political level. We have to ensure civil society is involved in this and that the political arm would have an arms and relationship in terms mm -hmm. of the management. The policy framework is different, but the day-to-day -day management has to be done by the relevant, technically competent people. Sir, tell us a little bit your thoughts on, on health. As you know, health is extremely important to this nation. Um, you know, not necessarily specifics, but your holistic and your party's holistic view, looking at you forming the next government, your thoughts on health. Well, the health sector has always been a very important sector for the People's Progressive Party. We have increasingly, uh, we have over the years increased the budgetary support and expenditure for the health sector tremendously. But one of the important issues in dealing with health is that we have to, let me deal with it from, from this angle. First of all, we have to ensure that all our people, all guys, have access to good primary health care. That includes having proper infrastructure, management system in terms of medical supplies and medicines. Mm -hmm. We have to ensure that at the second tier, the regional healthcare system works, that they're equipped, that they have the right complement of medical uh, personnel, that they have the right, the, the availability of not only equipment, but drugs and other supplies. So at the regional level, we have to ensure that the system works. What has happened over the last couple of years is that the system has collapsed. You yes. go to many health clinics and health centers, you go through the, the, the hinterland communities, the riverine communities, and I have gone to almost all these communities. There is mm -hmm. one complaint. Health is the primary issue. And what is the complaint? They're out of medical supplies. Their equipment is dumb. They don't have the medical personnel. They don't, when the drugs come, it is either close to expiry or expired. So these are the challenges that exist. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to how, build how, a health management mechanism right. to address mm -hmm. these issues. How does Dr. Ali, as president of this country, um, how do you uh, maneuver 
putting a politician in charge of, for example, health uh, versus putting a, a professional. Because remember, at the same time, a professional might not have administrative skills and a politician might not have the technical skills. How do you balance these two in your view, sir? And a politician can also be a professional. <laughs> yes, can. Can is the operative word. <laughs> that's just that. But well, let me say this. The, 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 it is, that is why I'm saying it is a mechanism. Mm -hmm. The politician is there to deal with the policies. The politician is there to deal with the overarching goals to ensure that the system works and deliver to the people. The politician or the minister is not there alone. He, we have to ensure that there is the right complement of staff that are not only technically competent, but are committed. That are committed to the task of providing the best possible health care. Mm -hmm. There was a time, uh, Dr. Mahadia, you know, when we did not have enough doctors. Recognizing this, Former President Jack Dale built a scholarship mechanism that saw a thousand young people being trained in the area of medicine. Many came back as doctors, some came back as pharmacists, some came back as lab technicians. Very important in yeah. filling that gap. Mm -hmm. What we have seen, however, in the last four years is that we have lost almost close to 45% of those persons from the system. So we spent resources to train these people, <clears throat> bring them in the system, <clears throat> and then over the last four years, we lost close to 50% of the people from the system. And why did we lose these people from the system? We lost these people from the system because of the way they were treated. These are young people. A lot of them are in the stage of gaining experience. They want to be on contract gratuity, not on a permanent establishment. You take away little benefits that they have. So as we look at the physical infrastructure, the governance mechanism, the institutional mechanism, <clears throat> we also have to ensure that we have a highly motivated human resource capacity that would implement and be committed to the sector. And to do that, we have to treat people properly. We have to look at the conditions of service. We have to improve the condition of services. We have to improve their welfare. Look, for example, those medical personnel who are on the front line for COVID-19. What special incentives have we given them? What support are we giving their families? They're out there every day amidst the great challenge to safeguard our country. Mm -hmm. What support is there for their family? Right. What support is there for the nurses? What risk allowance is there? So it has to be a system that is not only responsive to the needs of the population, but it's responsive to the human resources that have to manage the system so that we can get the best possible performance and level of efficiency from them. And mm -hmm. once we get this, once people are properly taken care of, then on the other side of the equation, we have to hold people accountable. We have to hold people accountable for this torture. These are important mm -hmm. aspects. And let me say this, why is we focus on primary health care too, Dr. Maradio? We are supporting from the Treasury many people who either have to go for uh, specialized surgery, whether it's uh, bypass, whether it's kidney, kidney transplant. We were going to build a, build a specialty hospital that was looking at a sustainable way of addressing specialized care. That is, Guyanese would have the services highly subsidized, 
whilst the specialized hospital would have also catered for overseas first Guyanese in the diaspora mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and overseas persons, persons who are residing outside of Guyana to seek treatment and seek care in the facility because the facility would have been providing the best possible health care in highly specialized areas. Mm -hmm. And the resources that we would have earned from that would have been used to cross-subsidize the services that is given to uh, Guyanese here at home. So we have to also pursue this model. Mm -hmm. We have to also, so, and then also, we have to support private hospitals in building up their capacity, mm -hmm. in equipping them, in ensuring that they have the necessary incentives and have a platform in which they can deliver higher levels of service, more specialized type of service, but at the same time, the incentives must be able to bring down the costs that these services are provided at. Mm -hmm. So right. it is not only the public sector or public health care that we have to look at. We also have to look at having the best possible private health care to complement the public uh, health care and mm -hmm. building a health sector that is beyond our shores. Correct. If you look at what, what is happening in Trinidad, for example, and the, and, and the level of regional people who move to Trinidad for medical treatment, or Barbados, mm -hmm. and you have to also build a teaching mechanism. So we cannot only think about right. the existing, what is what exists. We have to think about the future. And mm -hmm. how is it we can bridge that gap and get to the future as quickly as possible? Right. So, so that is that is the way we'll approach this uh, healthcare and healthcare services. But at the minimum, we have to ensure that Guyanese have the best possible primary health care available to them and we have to fix the regional health care system. Thank you. And, and to our viewers and listeners out there, I don't know if you would have uh, been carefully following the questions we have asked uh, Dr. Ali. And Dr. Ali, I, I'm so sorry we have been throwing everything at you. We have asked about uh, finance, we have asked about the economy, we have asked about health, we have asked about job creation, we have literally asked about everything including education. Sir, one of your campaign uh, tones would have been about um, ed the education and its cost at a university level. You want to just tell us a brief, uh, in a couple of minutes, um, what, what are your thoughts consistently? Is it still consistent as it was campaign time going forward? It would not change. Okay. Because we have a moral and ethical responsibility. That is why people voted for us. Mm -hmm. So our and commitment at the University of Ghana remains the same. However, Dr. Mahadio, mm -hmm. we can't look at things in isolation. We have to build an education sector that allows us to have education as a public good, one, but two, as a potential revenue earner. Mm -hmm. That is why we have to seek out <clears throat> our niche area. Suriname, for example, is having some good discovery of oil also. How is it we can ensure that in our educational sector, we address a few issues? Have a school of environmental science as second to none that can attract international students. Again, you're talking about cross-subsidization. We have the best mm -hmm. biodiversity product, an international school for the study of biodiversity. How do we build on the platform that we already have with medical offshore medical schools coming to Guyana? 
ensuring that we have the best that can attract students from across the world and ensure that we integrate it into teaching institutions. How is it that we are going to build an ICT platform that is knowledge-based? What incentives we will give mm -hmm. to, for, for, for the STEM program to ensure that we promote research and development? You right. and I know, Yo, that in Guyana, we lag behind many other countries. We, we are very poor in terms of research and development. Even the private sector, private companies invest very little in research and development. So these, so when you talk about the education sector, it's a holistic approach to look at how we can encourage uh, private um, providers to do better, to become more attractive, to create, uh, to create a framework in which Guyana can become a destination for educational services. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we build the existing and improving the existing condition in the public system to provide education as a public good up to university. Thank you. Dr. Ali, I must say this to you. Now, I, I want to just take your mind over to, to uh, a, a different aspect of our development. I just want to add I, one thing. So, sorry, sure. sorry to cut you. Sure. I just want to add one thing. Again, just like in the health system, we have to ensure that we address the welfare and well-being of those functionaries in the education sector itself. How is it we can ensure that they have better prospects of being in the system and having a good life in the sense mm -hmm. that they can be comfortable, they can own their own home, they can have a good salary, they can take care of their children, and they can see themselves as having a sustainable future, not only for themselves, but for their families. And that by itself would also help in attracting, uh, I don't want to say better, but in attracting more qualified personnel to enter into the educational system, mm -hmm. right? So, so, Dr. Ali, I must say this to you, um, and I'll say it twofold. I have been extremely critical, as you know, um, pre-2015 of a number of initiatives that the PPP government would have embarked on. One of those was the way the data cable uh, was managed. However, I must say this, with COVID now, Hindsight is always good. It's always, well, some hindsight, not all hindsight. Some hindsight is always good. Uh, but, sir, Dr. Jagdeo had, I believe, a fantastic vision in terms of a laptop in every home, data connection to every home. Will your government pursue that with, with a, a degree of immediacy and certainty, especially given the way education has to take one, place. One word, Dr. Mahadeo, immediately. immediately. Thank you. It is extremely critical, not only for well, education. It is extremely critical, and you know this, Dr. Mahadeo, for Guyana's competitiveness for us to address this issue. And, and what about the liberalization of telecoms? The building of the new sectors depends heavily on it. Mm -hmm. And you will see us moving rapidly to implementation. Neither your past government nor the current government has been able to deliver on your previous, on your and their previous promises of, of absolute liberalization and having competition in telecoms. <laughs> How are you? Yo, yo, uh, <laughs> you make me laugh with <laughs> that question. Because I you know, know you the would. answer. You I know, know you answer. would. You know that we were on the verge. We were on the verge of ending that monopoly. You know we were on the verge of ending that monopoly. And you know the intervening forces. This government came on the platform that they're going to end it. I think the promise was within the first 100 days. What have we seen? Mm -hmm. 
Where is the incentive mechanism to bring in a new cable or new providers? So I'm going to say this to you. Not only are you going to see action on this front, which, which I was, what I would say would be immediate, but you will see a launch out of a special program and incentive mechanism mm -hmm. to create competition and to bring down the cost of data and bring down the cost of telecommunication for every guy in this. We have to do it if we are to remain, if we are to be competitive, and we have to do it because it's a great burden on the pockets of our people. Doctor, Indeed. Dr. And, Ali. And, yes. Yes. Very then quickly, on the other side, uh, I want to take you in a different direction now. More than, a uh, little more than 40% of the country would have been told that uh, they have won the election uh, from the APNU coalition side, according to the recon figures. I want to ask you, what is it that you intend to do in your administration? Because we're talking social cohesion to fix the situation. We've seen some ugliness that was a raise its head during the last, uh, well, let's say more than a year, and especially within the last couple of weeks, real ugliness. What is it that your uh, administration intends to do to fix this problem in a short term, medium term, maybe long term? Leonard, we have to bring our people together. But we can't do so only by talking. We have to launch out a national platform. We have to launch out a developmental agenda in which every Guyanese see themselves a part of. We have to create and ensure that every Guyanese feel as if, not only feel as if, they must have a sense of belief that the programs and the policies that the government will pursue will bring betterment for them. At the end of the day, Every guy in this want to know that they have a job, they have an income, they have money in their pockets, they must be able to own a piece of land, build their homes, they must not be treated differently because who they are or which political party they supported. Whilst I'm saying this to you, what you will see in the government is a series of steps actions and measures that will bring these statements to life. And I'm very, very committed to lead a government that would bridge the divide, to lead a government that would heal and bring this country together. We can have the best economic prosperity, but if we continue to have differences that pushes us apart, then we will not be able to realize our full potential as a nation, or will we be able as a nation to enjoy the fruits of our labor and the fruits of the resources of our country? That is so, why I said early in this interview, mm -hmm. We have to deal strongly with those in our society who believe they can sit from afar, many of them, and spread hate, mistrust, create division, and mischief in our country. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with them. We have to develop no tolerance. We must have we must be intolerant to persons who want to divide us. An so, election doctor, is done. The results are there. It is time for us to embrace a common agenda and move this country forward. And I'm committed to this. Thank you. Dr. Ali, I, I, I've received, if you don't mind, uh, I, I've received a couple of questions here. I just want to quickly ask for your passing comments on them. Um, 
uh, people are, one of our viewers would have been concerned that um, that under the past PPP government, there's been all this concern about giving contracts, uh, ministries giving small contracts and large contracts to close people, to people close to loyalists of the, of the PPP government. And that has not changed under the next, when the change of government happened. Um, are you uh, going to pay heed to the various aspects? Because you can't, on one hand, you can't micromanage, but on the other hand, will you still be paying heed to all of these niggling issues going forward, sir? Yo, whether it's perception or real, as the new government, we have a responsibility to look at these issues, to ensure that the governance system is improved, to ensure that institutions' capacity and capabilities are improved, to manage in a better way, to manage in a more transparent way, and to manage in a way that will get the best value for our resources. These are important okay. things. Okay. And, and, and of course, and, and, and we are committed to these. Uh, and, and of course, I mean, uh, without asking you directly how you plan how you plan to do it, because at the end of the day, you have to depend on people, and it's the people that may or may not that may make you feel good or or make your hand fall. But um, well, well, look, 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 this just, is it. Well, yes. that is why I'm saying to you that the governance mechanism and institutional mechanism needs to be enhanced, mm -hmm. because if people are not delivering, if people are not doing what they're supposed to do, then there must be consequences. The system must be able to deal with them. The governance mechanism must be able to deal with them. And would a President Ali stand up personally, stand up personally against any perception of corruption by your officer, sir? Well, we have to be careful with what the statement you're making. We are going to stand up against corruption. We are going to, as a government, work on building and improving capacity to fight cor corruption and improve transparency. In dealing with perception, there, that is where you have to be careful sometimes. What I can tell you is that we can ensure that where there are instances of issues raised or perceived, we will seek to give information to dispel where it needs to, dis needs to be dispelled such perception. But in mm -hmm. terms of real corruption, yes, we will stand up uh, against that. Thank you. Well, sir, we spoke about a lot of areas, and and you know, I uh, mean, Dr. Mario, just for the benefit of the viewers, you as an as an independent consultant, you should also add your voice because I don't want to to say that as a politician, I'm saying this. You should explain how the perception indicators are derived. Sometimes the perception indicators are derived from a small focus group. Correct. Who you speak to. Again, Correct. you have the human aspect. Mm -hmm. Again, it is human beings you're dealing with. So we have to have a measure of real corruption. Mm -hmm. and, and one would and presume that is very then... that's important too. And that is where... <clears throat> The office of the auditor general comes into play. Thank you. Yeah. Ensuring the independence, ensuring they have the right skill set to look at the finances of our country, ensuring there's continuous training, ensuring that they get the resources that is necessary for them to execute their responsibility within the confines and constraints of the budget. Mm -hmm. Those are the so, important things. Thank you. And, and yes, you are right. And I must tell you, sir, that during, during the daytime discussion with Mr. Gildari, we have been talking about many of these things. Um, I know we have spoken a lot and I know we have taken a lot of your time tonight, sir. 
Uh, but there has been, I, I rather suspect there has been, there will have to be time in the future that we can talk about things like taxes, we can talk about tourism, we can talk about allocation of, of you know, um, focus, focus use of oil revenues for a build for the future rather than, than for its, its purpose now. But I'm sure we can do that in another segment of our discussion. Uh -huh. A key in this, we didn't get to talk about agriculture and your plan of building agriculture as a mainstay for Guyana's rise. I, I would be more than happy to be back with you uh, after the decoration on, on Tuesday or before uh, to discuss these and all other matters um, that I think the public and Guyana, and when we talk about Guyana, uh, Dr. Mahadi, we have to talk about Guyana in the context of Guyanese here and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Because this country has so much potential and it's going to be transformed at such a rapid pace. The need for skills and new type of skill sets will require us to look beyond uh, our shores. And the first natural tap-in that we have is our strong diaspora. So, you know, we have to ensure mm -hmm. that as a government, we consistently keep the lines of communication open and to keep people abreast with what is going on. Thank you. And here is another little thing I'm going to throw at you, sir, because I'm, I'm not so sure we're going to agree with this because I know your views might be very different from mine. But, uh, you know, I have made a public call. Given our experience over the past number of years, I have made a personal call and a public call to defund, defund state media, defund the Chronicle, because this damage that is being done to our psyche is, is incomprehensible and unacceptable. What's your take on that, sir? Yo, sometimes we allow, you see, sometimes we allow a few people to misdirect us. Like in this country now, you have 10 people maybe trying to change the narrative of an entire country. And we can't get sucked into that. What we have to do, any country requires to have an information outlet, any government. What we have to do is to make that outlet accountable to ensure we put systems in place that would ensure fairness, that would ensure there is no misuse of the state asset because it is state asset. Like we would have seen in this last campaign. And to do this, we have to have a level of professionalism in the management of these agencies. So I will say to you that the issue here is again, is improving the management and governance structure and ensuring that the entities work in a professional way and they're not misused. And my last question to you, sir. Under the previous uh, Dr. Jagan, when he came into office, he started uh, the concept of lean, clean, and mean government. We have seen a bloated government structure over the past five years. I think you have even had a talk, a joke. I know it's, it, went, it was said in, in passing, uh, Ministry of this and Ministry of that, and even got to Minister of Bicycles and Votes. Are you going to have a more contracted government, or, or, or are you hoping to have the same kind of expanded top, top government structure? We are now, I, I, I've, I have a few ideas. We are ready to go. But what you will have is a very focused government, focused on key sectors and key issues. That is what you'll have. You will not okay. have a bloated government and you will not have a situation where a hundred billion dollars is spent on wasteful expenditure. That I can assure you. Well, Dr. Ali uh, uh, and Mr. Gildari, Sir, thank you for being here on behalf of Kaicho Radio. Um, I'm going to just have Mr. Gildari say his uh, closing comments to you, sir, and then we're going to have you say your closing comments. Mr. Gildari. 
Well, thank I don't you. have really closing comments. What I could say, I want to say thank you, of course, uh, to Dr. Ali. He's always been very receptive to our invitations here at Kaichiro Radio. Um, uh, but let me ask him, one of the things that people like to see, uh, or one of what the people that they like to see, the politicians, and I want to ask you, do you intend to hold a lot of press conferences? Let's assume that you are sworn into office as early as next week. How many press conferences per year, if I may even project that? Because we are very interested in that. And the second thing is, uh, I think this is on a little deeper note. Uh, we seem to be having an impression that the population uh, is, is growing a little intolerant of their politicians. Uh, that being said, uh, they're going to, I think it's believed that uh, your presidency or the next, uh, the next administration that comes into play, um, they are going to be under the spotlight, a lot of scrutiny, um, uh, even more so over the last couple of years. How are you, uh, how is the administration, is the administration prepared, your administration prepared to deal with that, knowing that the elections are swiftly around the corner within five years? Well, Leonard, there is only one way to deal with that, performance and outcomes. You have to perform, we have to provide and produce the outcomes. You have to ensure the targets are met and we have to deliver a better Guyana. So our performance will do the talking. Thank you. Dr. Ali, it's been great to have you in room 592. And as you said, sir, as you intimated, uh, you don't mind being back and we certainly look forward um, so talking to you very soon again in the future as the president of the country. And we know based on the numbers that has been released to the public from the recount, you have led and your party has led and would have won these elections according to section 177. And sir, uh, in my book, you are the president elect. We now await the formalities of GCOM. We can only hope that it happened very quickly. Before we close and before we say good night to our viewers, sir, your closing comments at Room 59. Well, first of all, let me thank you, Yo, Dr. Mahadio and Leonard, for having me on your program. Let me thank all the viewers for listening, for allowing us uh, into their space. And I want to assure both of you and all, all uh, your viewers, all Guyanese, that let the next few days strengthen us, strengthen our resolve, strengthen our commitment, and strengthen our belief in a Guyana that will be better, one in which you will be properly represented, one in which you can be assured that a government would work in your interests, one in which we must pull together as one people, one nation, one destiny. Let us not be dis distracted uh, by comments let us not allow negativity to infest us or invade us. Let us be positive and let us look forward to a brighter future, a more fulfilling future. And I look forward to serving you, every Guyanese, to the best of my ability. And I can assure you, the People's Progressive Party Civic stands ready to be your servant over the next five years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, President-elect Dr. Irfan Ali. And sir, I close by saying this to you. It is my humble view that as president, and we will remind you, and trust me and, and Leonard as, as brothers in arms to remind you, you will be the chief public servant. And so we will hold you to that, as you said, to be Thank at the you. service of the Guyanese people, and we will remind you. It's been our pleasure to have you in room 592, sir. Do give our regards to your wonderful family. As we say, regards to Leonard's better half and his family, and of course, my lovely wife, Anita, and two sons, Yoga and Arya. President thank elect Irfan Ali, good night to you, sir, and thank, thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of my thank family, you. my wife, and my son, we would also like to uh, wish everybody the best. And to say to you and all Guyanese, continue to stay safe. Uh, we're going to be successful together. We end this together. There's only one outcome. Success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. To our viewers and listeners, it's been great to have you in room 592 with President elect Irfan, Dr. Irfan Ali. And do have a good night one over the weekend. Have a great weekend as well. Have a good night, one and all. 
Goodbye now from room 592.